So, we have a formulation here which is rock solid, this which is good but has some fundamental limi limitations which we've explored. But in this framework, in this mathematical framework, we want to now explore how this sort of uh, this sort of interpretation of the volumetric flux in the system can then lead us to a straightforward analysis technique. And unsurprisingly, this analysis technique is exactly the analysis technique they would you would use to study simple electrical circuits. <coughs> and that is that we say, well, <coughs> if we assume that these volumetric fluxes and these pressures take on some specific functional forms with time, this equation in particular can be transformed from a differential equation to an algebraic equation. And in particular, we can start by assuming that our pressure takes on a sinusoidal form and that our volumetric fluxes take on a sinusoidal form with time. When we do that, when we assume that this delta P is given by delta P naught times the cosine of omega T, then taking this derivative is straightforward. So this time derivative just turns this cosine into a sine. Or we could write this as a cosine with a phase lag. <clears throat> and that means that if I apply a pressure that's proportional to cosine omega t here, I'm going to get a volumetric flux that's proportional to cosine omega t here. If I apply a pressure that's proportional to the cosine omega t here, I'm going to get a volumetric flux that's proportional to the cosine omega t plus a pi over 2 phase lag. And in fact, in this system, everything ends up being proportional to the cosine of omega t. The only difference is that I might have a phase lag. This then, yeah, Henry. Should there be a negative sign of the Do, 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 do. I took the derivative of cosine. So that means I should have a minus sign, yes. And then do I need a minus sign on the last line? There we go, thank you. <coughs> so now I have a system where everything's proportional to this cosine. And this motivates my using phasor notation to describe this system. So now I want to take this description, which so far has been completely real, and I want to develop an analytic representation of these functions that will allow me to use more straightforward mathematics to come up with my solutions. That will allow me to take all of the time dependence associated with this compliance and turn it into a set of hydraulic resistances that just become complex. When I do that, then I have the same set of matrix, or I have the same matrix equations. I can solve it the same way. And the only difference is that my resistance is are really impedances, they become complex. <clears throat> Everything becomes straightforward. <clears throat> and remember, there are two reasons why we're doing this. The, the, the proximate reason is that I want to come up with a good way of understanding the compliance in the system and how it will change a microfluidic system's response to a sinusoidal perturbation. But I also need to prepare a mathematical framework that we'll use to study nonlinear kinetic responses of systems, which will require that we have sinusoidal electric fields. So this whole idea of developing analytic representations and phasor notation to describe these responses will be something that permeates the class. <coughs> 
So I'm going to write the analytic representation of a sinusoidal field. This can apply for pressures, currents, electric fields, etc. And I'm going to say, for example, if delta P is given by delta P naught cosine omega T, I'm going to write the analytic representation of that, which I'll denote with a little squiggle. as a complex exponential. Now, this complex exponential, j omega t, is equal to cosine omega t plus j sine omega t. And that means that this real parameter, this pressure difference, the thing that exists in the real world, is given by the real part of this analytic representation. Though, in my notation, I will use the squiggle to denote a complex number. <clears throat> and we'll use complex numbers in several different ways, but one of the ways we'll use it is to note the analytic representation of some sort of real field. So again, this thing exists in the real world. This is a mathematical representation that I will use to learn more about this representation of the real world. And mathematically, I go from this to this by taking the real part of this. <clears throat> now, why would it be helpful for me to write the analytic representation of a real function to solve these problems? Or maybe as a starting point, why on earth would this even be valid? Yeah, so I mean, so Euler's equation for this exponential is definitely the thing that tells me that the real part of this is this line above it. That's definitely true. <clears throat> but if I have a governing equation, right, I have P equals QR or V equals IR, this is a real equation in terms of real quantities, why wouldn't I write it in terms of real functions? Why would I use a complex function for this? Yeah, there's a, there's a phase lag, there's a natural phase lag that comes from the derivative function. Well, we might start with P equals QR, right? So if P equals QR for the real pressure, if that's true, that's a linear equation, that means that that equation I can multiply by any constant and it's still true. So if P is equal to QR, then 2 times P is equal to 2 times Q times R. And I can multiply both sides by j. So j times p is equal to j times q times r. <clears throat> and if these expressions are sinusoidal, I can add a phase lag to them, right? So if I take p and I phase lag it by 90 degrees, and I compare that to qr phase lag by 90 degrees, that's true also. So the first thing about this analytic representation is that this analytic representation is basically taking the real world and adding it to adding to it something that's phase lag 90 degrees and is also complex. Or to be precise, is also imaginary. So I'm taking this plus itself phase lagged by 90 degrees times j. Right? So if p equals qr applies to this, it also applies to this phase lagged by 90 degrees, and it also applies to this phase lagged by 90 degrees times j. So the first thing to note is that this complex representation has taken the real thing, which satisfies the governing equation, and added to it another thing that's phase lagged and imaginary, but that also satisfies the governing equation. That means that this analytic representation also satisfies the governing equation. Right, so I haven't solved any problems yet, but I've tried to make an argument for why if this thing satisfies the governing equation, which is p equals qr, then this thing does as well. Right? So now I feel like I have license to say, well, you know, okay, this real thing satisfies the governing equation, but the analytic representation satisfies the governing equation too. <clears throat> the analytic representation I find is way, way more useful 
Because any time I take a derivative, right, derivatives of exponentials just make me multiply times whatever is pre-multiplying the dependent parameter, or the independent parameter. So every time I take a derivative of this, I just multiply it times j omega. And this means every time I perform a time derivative operation on this function, it's equivalent to multiplying it times j omega. Right? So the game I'm playing, and the game that's played in undergraduate circuit analysis, is if the governing equation satisfies this thing, but, it's, but they're differential equations, those same equations will apply here, but those equations will become algebraic. And now I don't have to take the derivative with respect to t anymore because I'm extraordinarily lazy and I only like linear algebraic equations. So this idea now means that we can take anything that's varying sinusoidally and we can write the analytic representation of it. The pressure is varying sinusoidally, but I'm going to write the analytic representation of it. The current, or the, uh, the volumetric flux, is varying sinusoidally, but I'm going to write the analytic representation of it. When I do that now, this resistance and this capacitance, this hydraulic capacitance or compliance, now just turns into a hydraulic impedance. It becomes one complex number that I can use in an algebraic, albeit complex, expression to come up with what the flow is. So again, just as I would for electrical circuits, I can define an impedance. For a hydraulic impedance, I'll write it as Z sub H. This is a combination of a real part, basically the responsive part of the system, which is just the hydraulic resistance, which we've defined already, plus what's effectively basically a dissipative part, the part where my pressure isn't going into driving fluid through a tube, but rather filling up the various balloons in the system. And this is given by 1 over J omega C sub H. Where does this J omega come from? Yeah, it's, it's related to the fact that I had a differential equation, right? I said that Q was equal to CH DDT of the pressure drop. When I took the derivative of this, this uh, delta P was written as delta P naught exponential j omega t. If I take the derivative with respect to t, uh, to t of this, I get j omega, wait a second, uh, oh, here's my ch. So I have j omega ch times delta p naught j, uh, exponential of j omega t. So because this part had a differential, I get one copy of j omega from the sinusoidal term. And this now gives me my hydraulic impedance. 